this is fun. Let me see. It looks French. Maybe they'll give it a shot. Well, good afternoon, and thank you all for joining us um, for uh, what I believe you will learn about today um, is a comprehensive research effort on airport land use compatibility, uh, which was conducted by the Airport Cooperative Research Program of the Transportation Research Board, um, part of the National Academy of Sciences. Um, this afternoon, uh, we are privileged to hear from two national experts on aviation, airport planning, and land use compatibility. Uh, my name is Amanda Fagan, and I'm a project manager with the Department of Defense, Office of Economic Adjustment. Um, in the event that you don't know um, what the Office of Economic Adjustment is or does, uh, we provide technical and financial assistance to states and local governments that are affected by uh, defense program changes, uh, such as uh, base realignment and closure. Uh, we also administer the Compatible Use Program and the uh, better known Joint Land Use Studies. Um, in my work on joint land use studies, uh, the volumes that you'll hear about today uh, have become a, a favorite go-to resource of mine uh, on land use compatibility. Uh, and I hope you are as excited to hear from these speakers as, as I am. Um, now, as someone who has overcome a fear of flying over the last few years, uh, the chapters on um, aircraft accidents are, are particularly fascinating, I'll tell you. <laughs> Um, we are joined today um, by Stephanie Ward and Nick Miller. Um, Stephanie and Nick will first provide some background on the Airport Cooperative Research Program uh, and then delve into the results of um, the report Enhancing Airport Land Use Compatibility. Um, Stephanie Ward has more than 20 years of experience conducting planning studies for aviation-related projects. Uh, she's the manager of Aviation Planner Services for Mead and Hunt Incorporated in Lansing, Michigan, and has extensive experience in developing strong public relations uh, between governmental agencies and, um, and the public. Uh, Stephanie served as the principal investigator of the Transportation Research Board's Report 27, Enhancing Airport Land Use Compatibility. Uh, she's a licensed pilot and holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Urban Planning from Michigan State University and is a member of the American Institute of Certified Planners. Um, and as a Wolverine, I won't hold it against her. Uh, the <laughs> um, Nick Miller is a co-founder and senior vice president of Harris, Miller, Miller, and Hansen. Uh, Nick has a wide range of experience spanning more than 45 years related to environmental noise issues. Uh, from highway projects to auto racing to aviation noise around airports and overflights of national parks. Uh, he has served as project manager to a lengthy list of projects, including uh, many military-related studies such as Air Installation Compatible Use Zone or ACUS projects, um, and has developed computer noise modeling and prediction tools. Nick designed and developed Virtual Soundscapes, a tool that allows users to hear realistic recordings of existing and future noise events, uh, environments, excuse me. Nick holds degrees in mechanical engineering from Johns Hopkins and the University of North Dakota. Uh, he's also widely published on topics such as the effects of military overflights on recreational users of national parks and has served as an expert witness for aircraft noise litigation. Uh, so without further ado, I will turn the podium over to Stephanie and Nick. Um, I have to apologize, first of all, if any of you walked in and saw this initial slide. Um, one of the things that we've, uh, Amanda and uh, Serena asked us to do is give you a little background about what ACRP is, or the Airports Cooperative Research Program. And so Mike Solomon, whose name is on the slide, um, is actually the director of that program uh, for the National Academies and was unable to be here today. So I've been working with Mike now for four years, and so he asked if I'd mind doing the presentation since he's here, and I said that'd be great, no problem, I'd be happy to do that. And he said, because I'm going to be speaking at another conference. Um, can anybody guess what conference he's speaking at? <laughs> he he uh, shared the same presentation with me. So uh, just testing, make sure that you're not at the Western Pacific uh, Region Airports Conference. Um, 
The ACRP program um, has been very exciting for me to be involved in since its inception um, as a consultant in the industry. Um, it's actually a subset of the National Academies that was founded back in 1863. So it's a, um, a foundation, the National Academies, that's been around for a very long time and is about providing research. Uh, the Transportation Research Board is a subset of that that's been around um, not quite as long, but uh, certainly longer serving predominantly rail, uh, port, and um, uh, highway transportation. ACRP just came online back in 2004 uh, when it was authorized by Congress, and FAA actually funded it in 2005. So the program is, is in its infancy, if you will, uh, as a research uh, agency and has been um, developing new research. Some of the first uh, guidebooks and, and resources that were published uh, came out in 2008. It took that long for us to spool up, get staff on board for ACRP, solicit projects, get them underway, get them researched, and get the publications out. So um, it's, it's an evolving project, and we're hoping, uh, if any of you are following things right now, that FAA is going to get some funding very soon and that we'll be able to continue a new program for 2012. Um, what the program itself does is, is really looked at, looking at um, hands-on research that can uh, benefit the industry, the aviation industry. And many of the research ideas come from industry practitioners. And so that was one of our studies came from that, that we said, you know what, airport land use and land use compatibility is a huge topic. There isn't one guiding resource for us out there to use as <coughs> practitioners, airport owners, local communities. And so we need something that we could grab onto and use and at least hold up as some piece of information for us to um, use as a, a, a reference. And that's how a lot of these research projects have really taken off, that a lot of them come from the industry. They are submitted for um, uh, consideration. They're vetted by an oversight committee that looks at what's the greatest benefit for the overall industry as a whole. And then how do they um, apply? Can we actually use their research results in practice? You know, just creating research to say we've researched it, if it can't be something that we can actually then take and use and implement, um, they, they have kind of shied away from that, which has been exciting for us that we're actually getting pieces of research that we can use and grab onto. Um, the process itself is then once a, a topic is selected, uh, a panel is formed that is interested about that topic. These are usually industry professionals. And the reason we're sharing this information with you is many of you in the audience might be potential candidates for either panels or for research committees or consultants, um, or even to provide um, topics for review. So keep that in mind. There are some handouts throughout the um, um, audience uh, that say ACRP on them that kind of explains the process if you're interested. Once a panel's formed, they then create a, a work scope that is put out for a request for proposals from consultants uh, or industry researchers. Um, responses to those are submitted, they select a preferred consultant, and then the panel then guides the review and the research through the course of the project. Um, I've had the uh, privilege of sitting on two panels and being on the review side of things, and I've also been uh, on three different projects um, doing the research. And so it's a very enlightening process on both sides of the table, um, being able to give back to the industry. Uh, the Oversight Committee is a uh, wide range of aviation interests. Um, many of our larger airports across the country, um, research agencies, consultants, and we also have a number of ex officio members who are representing some of our larger um, interest groups, um, AAAE, ACI, um, NISEO, so a whole number. I'm going to throw out acronyms because I'm going to get back at all the military folks. Mm -hmm. I thought airports and the civil side had a lot of acronyms. I'm going to stay in the shallow end. After today, my head is swimming. I now know how the public feels when I get up and make a presentation and start talking about RPZs and BRLs, and I, I, I've been baptized now. <laughs> um, some of the things that are out there, I mean, the, the report that Nick and I are going to talk about is, is obviously our baby that's been out there, but there's a whole host of other resources that are out there um, that, that may be of interest to you. Uh, one of the first publications that was out there is Report 16, which was about how to manage small airports. This was for our general aviation uh, interest groups of how do we manage the over 3,000 um, general aviation airports that we have out there across the country. We also have a Report uh, 18 that's about passenger air service development techniques. How do we go out and develop um, uh, commercial service opportunities at airports? What's it really take? It's not just about getting Delta to agree to come to your airport. How do you have the infrastructure? How do you have the staff? Do you have the market capability? So there's a lot of really good information in that. 
Uh, report 20 is one that has just been um, published and a lot of uh, folks are using it, and that's providing strategic planning in the airport industry. And it's not just at the airport level, but as the industry as a whole, how do we look at strategic planning uh, as, a, as an entity, as an industry? Um, this is kind of a complement to the managing small airports. It's one that's uh, targeting marketing guidebook for small airports. So how do you as a small airport who might have a staff of one, uh, how do you get out into your local community and make sure that people understand what your airport's about? Um, we take this one pretty seriously. We pretty much hand this one out in tandem with our land use one to say, we're not going to be successful in our land use efforts if you don't effectively market the airport as a whole. And so uh, we've really found this one to be very uh, helpful in our use. There's also other activities that the um, ACRP does besides the actual reports. Um, they have a legal digest that's available. Um, this is very helpful. It kind of takes everything that's out there in the industry on these different topics and distills it down into basically the meaty points, if you will, and gives you the highlights. Um, this one is an example of a survey of law and regulations for airport commercial ground transportation. So people want to know, how do we regulate taxis, buses, things like that? You know, what's going on in the industry? We don't want to have to call 10 of our peers and ask them what they're doing. ACRP did the work for you and, and put it all in one spot. Uh, another one that they did was a model for improving energy use at airport facilities. Again, uh, pretty well done document. Um, it's kind of the Reader's Digest version, if you will. Gives you the high points. Um, looked at some best practices for using energy, reducing energy use. Um, and has uh, a number of case studies that uh, are pretty informative. Um, we also have some reports that um, what they've done in a several instances have said, some of the research topics are of interest, but we're not sure where it would go. You know, what will it, what will it really manifest itself into? And so on several of the studies, they have taken them and done an overview project where they say, let's go out and take a look at what we know is out there or see what the industry really wants to know about it. And from there, we'll decide if it's going to become a full-blown project or not. And uh, this one on safety management systems was one of those that they started out with the overview, <coughs> and they've subsequently then developed a full-blown guidebook that's out there. Um, with that, that's just, like I said, kind of a really brief overview of what ACRP, or the Airport's Cooperative Research Program, is. Um, if you have any interest, I believe we're up to um, report number 57, uh, 57, 58, something like that, um, plus all the legal digests. Um, all of those are out there on their webpage at uh, trb.org uh, forward slash ACRP and are all downloadable for free. So um, feel free to go out there and take a look. Um, they've started um, uh, posting everything. They've really worked really hard to revamp their webpage to make it more user friendly so you can find things a little easier. Um, and then they've got a uh, listing, as you can see here on the right side. Um, as a new document comes out, you can, um, they post it there so you can see what's current. And you can also apply to get um, email um, notices of when they publish new topics. And you can vet that by um, certain topics that you might be interested in. Um, they've also got um, uh, a, an interesting piece. And I, I know for a fact on the, the middle one there, the guidebook uh, transforms niche in smaller airports. They're working really hard to figure out how do these um, uh, reports and the legal digest affect what we're doing in the industry. And so they've asked that if you use some of these um, uh, documents, that you consider sending them an email towards their impacts on practice and let them know if you've used them. So I certainly encourage you, if uh, we convince you that maybe you should use the uh, uh, Report 27 in some of your uh, land use activities, if you find it beneficial or helpful, um, send them an email because they're very interested in knowing how any of these different documents um, are, are helping change uh, how we're doing business. Um, with that, that's kind of the overview of um, ACRP. Any questions on that before we jump into the other presentation? You guys are troopers. I know it's warm in here. We'll try to move quickly. Um, one of the things, this is a, a topic, uh, if, if you were in it, how many people were in the previous session in this room? Okay. Um, what I'm going to ask you to do is you're going to kind of rewind. Um, what you saw in the last session was you've done the JLU study and you're ready to implement it. What our presentation is about today <coughs> is more of taking a step back in terms of what are some of the things that you need to be cognizant of, why are you even doing that study, and what are the things that 
I would challenge you to the local communities are asking themselves, why am I being bothered by this? If it's not broke, don't fix it. Um, you know, question was asked about, well, if you can't use the Z word, you know, zoning, what do we do? Um, these are some of the things that we're going to cover through here that hopefully will give you some tools and techniques to address that and hopefully give you a, um, I think you used to tool, toolbox, um, some things in your toolbox that you can utilize. Um, you will see that there's a, obviously a civil slant to it because it was written with civilian airports in mind, um, but I certainly think it translates. And you'll see in a couple instances we actually use some um, Air Force Base or um, air facilities as a part of the presentation. Um, our project team that we had for the program or for this report um, was a pretty eclectic mix. Um, Mead and Hunt is a uh, national aviation firm, and so we deal with everything from commercial service and military facilities down to some small GA airports um, and, and do a lot of airport planning. And so we're very well versed in that. Clarion Associates was a company out of uh, Denver who does a lot of municipal planning. And so we felt that was important. You know, we, we don't want to just come in and talk the airport side because that's usually one of the places we get a lot of pushback from of, well, it's not all about the airport. And the response is, you're right. It's about making the community as a whole. So Clarion was a, a key player. Nick, obviously, um, from Amanda's introduction, um, when we thought about, well, you know, noise is one of the biggest issues as it relates to compatibility. Who better than the experts in the industry, which is HMMH. So they were critical to our um, project. Uh, Jeff Gosling um, will be Amanda's friend because he was the, uh, <laughs> the team member who handled a lot of our accident statistic analysis. Um, and then Unison Consulting uh, was on board to uh, provide our economic impact uh, discussion, which we'll talk about in a minute. And then Richard Lee is a professor out of uh, UC Berkeley who provided some general oversight and uh, kind of kept us in line as we moved forward. So a really eclectic team that was, um, this actually took up about two and a half years of our life, and I, I mean that seriously. Um, it was kind of an eat, sleep, and breathe this entire project. And this kind of highlights how that happened. Um, in the document itself, um, the first thing we did is we said, well, you know, we, we really need to know what's out there that talks about compatible land use. Where do we even start? You know, there's a lot of different resources, but none of them are what we consider to be, you know, the be-all, end-all. And we came up with over 300 documents. Um, and sources that talked about land use in some form or capacity. Uh, and one of the things that we felt was really important was making sure that people had access to that. So all of those resources have been annotated are in a separate volume of this research. And it's all categorized by different uh, topics. So you can go and reference that if you need it. We also conducted a study of every airport in the country and said, if you'd like to participate, we'd love to hear what are your land use concerns about your facility, are you doing anything about it, and what... Uh, what's worked or what hasn't. Um, 120 airports um, participated in that survey, which we thought was pretty good considering there was, you know, no incentive for them other than the fact that they were sharing information with us. And so a lot of that information uh, is reflected in the study. And then from there, we actually conducted 19 case studies. And Nick and I are going to highlight three of them uh, as a part of the presentation that really gave us a lot of background and information about what was going on. Some of them were good case studies of where they've gone out and done land use compatibility zoning and it's gone really well. Some are perfect examples of what happens if you ignore it and it doesn't go away. Um, some of them um, are great examples of where they've tried and things have worked well. Some of them aren't working, you know, are, are working through. So it was a really nice blend and all of them were very cooperative in sharing both the good and the bad um, so that we were able to bring that into the case study. Um, one of the things that I found really interesting when we dug into this is that the concept of land use compatibility around airports actually goes back to, clear back to 1952 and, and a document called the Doolittle Report. That's its common name. And in that, we talked about things such as clear zones and what are now, you know, in the civilian side, runway protection zones. Um, and, you know, if you go through, there's actually about 25 different recommendations that were in that study. And every one of them as you read it today, you know, almost 60 years later, you go, great idea, why weren't we doing it? Great idea, why weren't we doing it? And, and you almost check off every single one of the pieces that way and say, what happened? And, uh, you know, basically what happened is land was cheap. Uh, you know, we've got a lot of case studies where, you know, it was easier just to pick the airport up and move it to somewhere else than deal with the problems. And, you know, as you've probably heard with the, the case studies earlier today, um, we just can't afford to do that anymore. And so it's something that we've got to address. Which kind of brings it to the second point there is as far as the value. You know, civilian airports alone create $507 billion of economic activity a year. 
we can't afford to lose those kind of facilities because of that, you know, economic impact. Uh, you know, 6.7 million airport-related jobs across the country, and uh, 33.5 billion uh, generated in local, state, and federal taxes. And these figures, I believe, are from 2006. So, you know, that's even dated information. So we've got a huge economic engine here that we really have to be looking at to preserve. And, you know, the consequences if we don't, um, you know, I, I kind of, when the um, uh, aircraft landed on the Hudson, um, you know, flight 1549, um, for those of us who work in the land use compatibility industry, it was like, I'm glad nobody died because this is a great case study. This put the concept in front of every person across the country, no matter who they were. And I no longer had to talk about these things in concept. They had a perfectly good example that they could grab a hold of that talked about the consequences. There's economic cost, the safety, limiting development, impact on the airspace, and it was right there front page for us. So, you know, we said we hated to capitalize on, on a negative, but, you know, sometimes you got to do that sort of thing. And so it's been helpful for us, and we've seen a difference um, in the projects that we've done since then that people are more receptive to say, oh, I get it. Uh, they don't necessarily like it any better, but they at least get it more about why we were talking about land use compatibility. One of the things that we did as a part of the study um, looked at economic costs. And um, the study wasn't about creating a, you know, a full drawn out, how do you plug in the numbers, what do you do with it. Um, so there's a small section in the main report that talks about what some of the impacts are from an economic standpoint, things you should consider. And there's a whole uh, separate chapter that's in the second volume that actually walks you through some of the different ways to look at it. But essentially what it boils down to is, you know, we are looking at a number of different variables. And you can pick any one of them or a multiple of them that can draw to what's the impact if we don't do land use compatibility. Everything from delay of, of travel costs to increased construction costs. Several of our case studies, for example, um, we found that projects were delayed anywhere from 10 to 20 years. And so what did the cost, economic costs go up, the um, uh, cost of travel time go up, you know, the impacts to how much lost revenue because we couldn't make some of those improvements. Not to mention then from the community side, loss of economic development. We had a couple of the case studies say, you know, we had major businesses walk away from our community because we told them we couldn't expand fast enough. So, you know, all of those things are different ways to look at it, and our study basically um, uh, gives some examples of things that you could go out and investigate or comment on as it relates to that cost. Uh, one of the examples that we did in some of the, um, as part of our survey, was we asked if you'd been involved in any litigation as it related to land use issues. And six airports did report back and, and provide us some information that, yes, they had. Three of them were GA and three of them were commercial service. And I think some of these numbers tell the story. Um, you know, some of them ranged the attorney fees. Some of them said they were pretty minor. We had to do a little condemnation. Yeah, it was $2,500 in attorney fees. Uh, one of the other ones said it was absolutely ugly and we spent $4 million in attorney fees. Those are some pretty big numbers. Um, staff time, you know, anywhere from $2,700 to over half a million. Uh, settlements, you know, so all these are, you know, adding up. You know, these aren't just one, you know, two million and we're out or four million and we're out. All these are cumulative costs that we keep moving up. Uh, and, you know, anywhere from 30 months delay to over nine years. So, you know, significant amount of impact that, you know, plays into your development and the value of your study um, and you, the value of your airport. Um, Amanda's favorite topic, <laughs> um, aircraft accidents. One of the things that we looked at was, you know, when we talk to communities and we talk about, um, you know, land use, we don't want to sound like chicken little. We don't want to, you know, build this whole philosophy that, you know, the sky is falling and aircraft are going to be falling out of the air. But we do have to look at the statistics. One of the things that we found as a challenge was when we looked at commercial aviation versus general aviation because we thought, well, there might be some difference. You'll see there really isn't a lot. 60%, 67% of all commercial aviation accidents happen what's considered to be on airport, and 66 of general aviation happen on airport, with the remainders being, you know, in the 20 to 25% range on airport vicinity, which is a five-mile radius, and then en route. Now, the challenging part with that comes from when we look, did some scatter diagrams to take a look at this. Uh, this scatter uh, diagram is actually from uh, uh, the California Land Use Handbook um, and is based in 2002 data. And you'll see this little concentration that's right at the crossroads of the um, 
lines, that's the runway proper. As we continue farther out, you'll see they scatter both ways. Well, the challenging part with this, and we found when we started plotting these, was that some of the terms that were used were a bit um, ambiguous. If we go back and, oops, wrong way. You know, we look at the term on airport. Well, you can probably all think of a small general aviation airport that you know that, you know, you drive by on the road and you can see the runway. You know, what's on airport? Well, you don't have to go very far. Probably the runway protection zones aren't on airport. You know, they're on private property. So their on airport could only be two, 300 feet. You've got other airports, you know, commercial airports that have hundreds of acres that are considered to be on airport because it's airport owned property. So when we started looking at the accident data, we really realized that using those terms in their truest sense were pretty erroneous in terms of telling us where are the critical areas that we want to look at. So we had that issue. We also had an issue with looking at, well, what is the phase of flight? Are they landing or taking off? What's the critical area? Are they, you know, coming in too shallow and so we're getting accidents off the end of the runway? Or is it on takeoff, they're stalling? And, you know, where do they go? Are they turning left? Are they turning right? And what we really found out in a lot of these cases is that we weren't getting the information in the accident reports themselves. We found accidents on uh, uh, several that, um, you know, the accident happened three miles from the airport, but the lat long coordinate that's in the accident report is the airport reference point dead center in the airport. That doesn't do us a lot of good in trying to plot it. Uh, we also tried to look at, you know, what's kind of our debris field. You know, are we getting a quarter mile debris field, minimal debris field, and again, none of that kind of information is being recorded accurately. So we've actually um, put together a proposal and it's it been submitted as one of the next research projects uh, for consideration is to go into more depth and trying to figure out and look at this information to try to get us some additional uh, factors. Uh, some of the European models actually instead of, you know, we're all familiar with the trapezoidal shape that fans out away from the runway end, in Europe they're actually a cone shaped they come off the runway end out to a point um, because their tracking of the data shows, well, there's a lot more happening right here off the ends of the runway than as we extend out where, you know, we appear to go in reverse. So a lot of questions still in that. So don't, don't get panicked. Right? <laughs> it's still relatively safe to fly. So um, from there, what we, we looked at is, you know, when we talk land use um, and, and the reason that, you know, Nick is a part of the presentation and we've got a whole segment here talking about noise is that's the first thing that most people can identify with. I mean, it's just, it's obvious. You see the plane fly over, you hear it, noise is an issue. Well, that's one of four or five actually common concerns that we have when we talk about land use. And, um, you know, one of them being uh, population density, tall structures, visual obstructions, and wildlife. So we've kind of grouped them into these four categories and five if you count the noise element to help us explain to the general public as well as ourselves as we're trying to develop tools and techniques to address these issues. Coupled with that, we also have, have identified it looking at the different types of land uses that are out there because obviously we're not going to treat them the same either. You know, there's no one size fits all. If we learned anything through this study, it's that we can create a general guidebook but that's exactly what it is. It's a general guidebook. Each community has to look at this and really embrace it on their own. So one of the things that we took really seriously with, with the guidance was to look at and talk to people about what do we mean about these different types of concerns and the corresponding land uses. So you know, when we talk about population density, the one that always comes to mind is, well, residential. Well, you're right, residential is obviously a concern for us. Um, you know, if you go to Nick's booth, he's got a great program um, that you can kind of see the difference of what's it like to be outside and hear noise outside in your yard compared to in your house, compared to with the windows closed. And it, it kind of paints the picture for you that some of these things we can mitigate as we get to uh, the uses. Um, we also, when we talk about population density, you know, we're talking about special uses. Um, we had a, one of the case studies talked about wanting a, a NASCAR track off the end of the airport. They were very concerned about what about putting that large of a concentration, even though it's for a short duration, off the end of the airport. Uh, the local solution was, well, we'll just close the airport <laughs> during, the, during the race. And we said, well, that's kind of how people are going to get in, is we kind of need to have that facility open to facilitate that. Um, you know, we're also talking about things such as, uh, you know, special uses, um, you know, things that are going to create, um, again, other concentrations of people, or even recreational. Uh, we do, we've got a case study I know that um, 
uh, had a very large recreational complex, you know, the four or five softball, baseball, diamond configurations, that we had a large number of people that were in a very close proximity to the end of the runway that gave us some pause that we said, you know, that's almost more concerning to us because it's coupled with some of the other concerns, such as light emissions, that it creates a more dangerous situation to us than having residential would. Um, and then I just have to point out, that's one of my favorite pictures of all time of the Aviation Week. Um, this is an airport up in Maryland that the airport manager found out about this development literally when the bulldozers came out to start putting in the infrastructure. Um, it didn't go under by cover of darkness, but the local community planning uh, folks didn't even consider that they should have talked to the airport about this. So. Um, I actually had um, a guy who grew up and flew out of that airport come up to me at one of my presentations and said, that's my airport. And yeah, you're right, it's, it's horrible. They, they lost with the displacement to that runway threshold um, uh, 600 to 800 feet of runway length. Um, that was just you know, devastating and you know, those houses aren't going anywhere. Um, so you know, we're, we're concerned about that kind of land use. Uh, tall structures, you know, those are usually the one right behind noise that's pretty obvious for us to talk about to local communities. Um, you know, the wind turbines, obviously, they've become our new cell tower <laughs> as far as where do they go, what do they do. Um, I think the real challenges for us on those is that unlike cell towers, we at least had the FCC working with us. You know, we had one more line of defense. Um, we don't have that now. Um, we just finished a system plan for the state of Iowa. And we had four different airports um, that are all general aviation airports come in and tell us that their minimums for approaches had been raised because they've got wind turbines in their approaches that they knew nothing about. They just kind of happened. Um, you know, and we talk pretty routinely with the FAA about their notification procedure under um, FAR Part 77 with their um, airspace review. You know, that's a review. You know, we try to explain to local communities, and if any of you aren't familiar with it, you know, that review process is only that. There's no approval. Um, we've got plenty of airports who um, developers have gotten letters that have said it's not a hazard, and once they build them, the minimums at the airport go up. So there's very significant concern on our part that, you know, FAA is not empowered to do proper airspace um, control, if you will. They have no legal power to tell somebody no. They just have the right to define it as being a hazard. And so that's a very big uh, you know, misnomer that somebody comes in and says, well, I've got a non-hazard determination from FAA. It must be okay. It's not. So you know, use that as, uh, as a tool, but make sure you're checking with it because it can have a, a really adverse effect on your community. Um, and then vegetation. You know, um, a lot of the activities that we work with, I've got a lot of communities who've gone out you know, back in the 50s and 60s, got avigation easements, they got filed, managers have changed both at the airport and the community, and the next thing you know, we've got obstructions because nobody realized we've got the right to go trim trees. So, you know, there's a lot of that that you've got to be diligent in policing, you know, what's going on in your community. Visual obstructions, this is one that, you know, becomes a little harder for us to gauge because sometimes it's relative um, and sometimes it's obvious. Um, you know, we've got an airport, we just did a zoning uh, ordinance for over in Wisconsin that wait, is right on the Mississippi River. And we talked about glare of off the body of water. And one of the locals threw up his hands and said, are you kidding me? We're surrounded by the Mississippi River. What do you want us to do? And I said, well, okay, that one we're not going to be able to change, okay. But the rest of them we can. And they had a uh, local uh, business that did a lot of um, strobe light and um, the big spotlights. And so we actually had to address him as a part of our land use zoning um, that he needed to contact the airport and the tower before they were going to do that so we could make sure we got adequate notams out and make sure we you know, were directing it appropriately to not be blinding the pilots. So as a matter of communication, we wrote some of it into the ordinance. We talked with this company to make it work. But it was one that um, you know, wasn't readily apparent when we started talking about typical things that we're looking at. Um, steam and emissions, um, the, the third one there, that's actually a um, ethanol plant in the state of Michigan that was built and we coordinated with that plant. They came into the community and said, we'd really like to build on the west side of the airport. There's a large uh, uh, tract of land for us. And when we started looking at it, we said, well, the predominant winds are from the west. All that steam that you guys generate is going to obscure all the visibility at the airport. So we coordinated with them and what we ended up doing is keeping them in the community and we moved them to the east. Uh, we managed to move them about five miles away from the airport to the northeast. So we very rarely get winds from that direction. And when we do, 
it blows and dissipates enough before it gets to the airport. And our local folks are totally excited because they call that their new VOR, you fly to the smoke. <laughs> so, you know, win-win. Um, we also then look at the wildlife attractants. Like I said, you know, the landing on the Hudson really brought that one home for us. And, you know, that's really a challenge for us. I think that's probably one of the hardest ones for us to regulate with other federal agencies. Um, that's one where we certainly are usually at odds. Uh, you know, local uh, DNRs and DEQs want us to mitigate wetlands as close to the source as possible. We want to get it as far away as possible. Um, recreational uses, you know, golf courses when I first started in the aviation industry, completely compatible land use. You know, it's pretty much open. Uh, we've got long fairways that people could land on. Well, that was until the Canada goose population, you know, spiked, and now we've got them all over golf courses. Um, we've got other wildlife, you know, deer, et cetera. And so we really don't want recreational uses such as um, golf courses or large parks that are going to create those kind of wildlife attractants. Farmland, you know, that also previously was considered fairly compatible. Now we have got to take a really hard look at it in terms of what are the ancillary um, impacts that we could have for it. Uh, one of the airports we just recently worked with in Wisconsin um, uh, it has a lot of farming operations completely off airport. And they said, listen, this is our livelihood. We can't afford to, uh, you know, give this up. We can't zone this property such that we can't use it. So what we worked out with them is that, um, A, they would um, work with the local USDA and adopt best management practices for their grain harvest so that we're not getting a lot of residual grain left on the field. And two, when they are harvesting, you know, they're creating huge dust plumes that were essentially closing the airport. So we're working with them now to coordinate with the airport when they're going to do those harvests so that we can, again, issue notums, talk with the tower, let people know what's going on, and that way we can coordinate with the local users. Um, so trying to make a win-win situation. Then finally, noise. I mean, that's the granddaddy of them all. That's the one that most people can relate to. And, uh, you know, we've dedicated an entire section of this guidebook towards noise. And Nick's going to talk about that um, in more detail in just a moment. So what we tried to do, um, you know, as Amanda mentioned in my bio, um, you know, I'm an urban planner by, by degree. You know, as you all know probably in the room, that's really the people who are your front line. I mean, it's the local community planners who are going to have to adopt, implement, and enforce this stuff. And so we really felt fairly strongly that this document really needed to talk to those folks and give you as much guidance as we can to understand these things. And so what we did is we took those different land use categories that we typically see in a comprehensive plan or an airport or a zoning ordinance, and we applied that to the five different areas of concern and provide just a quick, um, you know, cheat sheet, if you will, of do we think that would be a concern. And so you can see here, for example, um, multifamily housing. So apartments, uh, low rise, medium, high rise, et cetera. What we've done is said, going across those different categories, would we consider that to possibly be an impact that we've got to be thinking about? So you can see noise sensitivity, definitely. There's probably going to be an impact there that we want to make sure we're thinking about. Concentrations of people, well, definitely if we're talking multi-stories, you know, certainly the 13 and above, and a potential impact when we're talking about maybe mid or low rise. Again, it's relative to where is it relative to the airport, to the approaches, and so you need to take a lo uh, better look at that. You know, tall structures, uh, again, high rise probably, depending on where it's at at the airport, and then it gets an N on the low rise because you're probably not going to be building a structure that tall, that close to the runway um, that would be a concern. And then continuing across, you know, visual obstructions, um, possibly on a high rise, depending on the building material. You know, if we get some reflective glass, if we get um, parking lot lighting that isn't down shielded, et cetera. And then also the wildlife attractants that uh, typically the lower rise we're not necessarily going to see. Um, large uh, retention basins for stormwater runoff, et cetera. But we could, and so again, want us to take a look at it. So each of the different uses has this kind of a, a cheat sheet, if you will, that talks about the different types of <coughs> concerns we'd have. And then leads into what do we do with it? And we'll talk about that in just a minute. One of the other things that we were asked to do as a part of the study was look at, well, who's really got responsibility for land use? And you can see it's kind of a spaghetti mess. <laughs> Um, you know, there's federal stakeholders involved. You know, FAA is a part of grant assurances for our, our civil airports, and, you know, you as a military have your own. Um, civil airports sign it on an agreement every year when they take a grant that says we are trying to protect our airport from compatible land use. Um, I challenge a few of them to say, really? <laughs> Show me how you're really doing that. Um, so there's federal stakeholders involved as well as federal regulations. 
there's obviously the state stakeholders. There's a number of states um, that have taken it pretty seriously, have developed their own guidebooks, developed their own authority to do zoning. You heard a little bit um, in the last session, you know, Texas has their own um, zoning chapter. Wisconsin has one. Michigan has one. And then it boils down to regional stakeholders. Some places, you know, the local um, uh, MPOs have been empowered to go out and do zoning. Um, Puget Sound Regional Council out in Washington State is one that's done that. It's been given, they've been given the authority to govern land use around the 28 airports out there, uh, or at least guide it, I should say, not govern it. But uh, And then obviously it's the local stakeholders. I mean, that's really where the rubber hits the road. No matter what you want to do, it's going to come back down to that local coordination and empowerment. Um, and then, you know, obviously then impacting the airport side. I had an airport manager who literally looked me in the eye and said, well, once it's done, I'm out of it. <laughs> and I said, how can you even think that way? You are, you are the first line. You are on every day being an ambassador for your airport to the community. Um, and so he and I had a long talk about what his responsibilities really were. Um, and so one of the things that leads into that then is, you know, the regulations. Obviously, there's a lot of players and there's a lot of regulations. And that was one of the things that we um, found to be a real challenge is, you know, there's, there's DOD and FAA. All of them have their own design, airspace, noise, environmental. Some of them are conflicting with each other. Some of them are conflicting with other federal agencies. And, you know, it's, it's kind of a, a soup that you kind of got to pick out the pieces you get and figure out what's really appropriate to your local community as far as which players you really need to have at the table. Um, and noise is probably the biggest piece of that. I mean, there's so many different pieces of regulation that can apply to it. You get HUD, you get um, FA, you get DOD, you get some of your um, local and state authorities involved. And so because of that, um, part of the study really emphasized noise. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Nick to kind of really talk and focus in on that element of the study. Okay. Um, my daughter uh, led for, uh, bicycle tours for a while, uh, <coughs> and she led some in Vermont. And one of them in particular, uh, I don't know if you know Vermont, but there's a large lake, Champlain, between New York and Vermont. And one of the tours, part of the trail, or the, the ride, was across a ferry in at Lake Champlain, northern portion. And she's a leader. She got there early, and she was just passing time. And she saw a little general store. And she went up to it, and on the outside, on the door, there was a sign that said, there are no public restrooms inside. She said, okay, well, that's not unusual. She went in. And she saw a little lady sitting behind the counter, and there were some more signs on the front of the counter. One was, no, there really are no restrooms, <laughs> public restrooms inside. <laughs> Next sign said something like, every 30 minutes, it just goes back and forth, back and forth. This is the ferry. And the, the third one that she remembered was, five cars, a tractor, and a, a farmer with a shovel. And my daughter, Brooke, looks at them, and she says to the little lady, I guess those must be answers to the questions most people ask. And the little lady held up a sign that said, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and my point in this little thing is that I enjoyed the, the story, but people in large part are predictable as to what they do. And we know what's going to happen about noise in, in, in the large part. And particularly if we describe it the same way over and over, we know what's going to happen. People don't understand DNL. And I, in reflection on thinking about this presentation this time, I realized that a good part of my career has been a kind of a light motif of how to describe noise, how to get it across. And part of this presentation, a significant portion, is about describing noise and DNL, its rela the relationship between DNL and the effects. Okay, so. Um, this is, was done for civil airports, but I think it trans a lot of it translates directly to what, what you guys do, uh, military installations. Uh, it's obviously a uh, primary constraint for, for um, civil airports on capacity. And there's a historical reasons for the, the conflict. There's lack of coordination planning. And the big one to me is misunderstood assumptions about noise uh, and land use compatibility. Um, the noise compatibility, you know, is pretty much universal now, not only in the U.S., but in other countries of, of a DNL type metric, this energy average or total energy metric with a, some kind of weightings for different times of day. And it was done in the 1970s, the 65. And 
It was done almost simultaneously on the West Coast and the East Coast, the West Coast for California, East Coast for uh, HUD, and also some work on the West Coast for the military. And they looked at all they could find about annoyance, speech interference, sleep disruption, disturbance, and complaints, and came up with uh, uh, 65 as kind of a, a reasonable starting point. And it was interesting to note when I looked into this that most of the, the recommendations, the reports, said review this again. We think this might be a little permissive, but uh, it's a good start. And as far as the civil aircraft were concerned, they were much louder then. You had 707s and, and things that were much so that they, the, the noise levels, and just from a feasibility standpoint, uh, the 65 was pretty large. In fact, we've looked at some of our clients, and the 65 in 1980 or so is now uh, the 60. I mean, they sort of shrunk that much, where an aircraft in particular have gotten much quieter, individual ones. Okay, well, these are just some average levels. You've, you're familiar with this, um, where the 65 is kind of a noisy urban area if there aren't any aircraft there or airports. but. Um, generally ranges you know, in, in where people live from 50 to 75 at, wor at most occasional places. Uh, we measured once at uh, Yuma uh, at a, uh, a, a residence off the end of the runway and uh, they had 85 DNL, which is, it didn't seem to bother them. And I think one of the reasons is it was because there were few but very loud events. And I'll talk about that some more later. Uh, the, you and the communities are, Air installations, airports, and communities have different objectives, right? And, and the question is, can you get alignment? I think with the, with the military, there's, there can be this obvious economic and important connection. Uh, commercial airports can try to work that too, though often there's so many, ver uh, so many people living around uh, some of these civil airports that uh, a lot of people really don't care about the, the economic aspect. They just care about the noise or the traffic generated. Um, the 65 has really been beneficial. It's been something that we've been able to use to try to control land use and to, to ch identify as an impact area. But I think that a better understanding of DNL is, will help, um, could help airports and communities get along. Just to give you an idea about this, and this may all be familiar to you, because of the way um, DNL is computed, it's real, there's really an infinite number of ways to produce a given value of DNL. And I've got three examples here that are just kind of arbitrary, but just to make the point. What I've got is the maximum sound level of an aircraft and then the required number of operations in 24 hours with no nighttime consideration though, uh, to give you give 65 DNL and the time above for each individual um, operation, the time above 60, which kind of relates to the amount of time you'd have speech interference indoors with windows open, and then the total time uh, above uh, sp uh, speech interference for that many operations. 95 uh, dB, I looked into my data and uh, using F-18 as a reference, that's kind of the level that you get at 1,000 feet altitude, like maybe when it's dirty and on approach. Uh, maybe if the downwind leg is at 700 to 1,000 feet, it would be what you'd experience each time one went over. Uh, 85 is something that might be three to four miles from a ground controlled approach. Uh, and the uh, 75 is sort of like 10 miles from brake release on a departure to give you a sense. Now, as you can see, uh, you need 1,075 maximums to get a DNL 65. And there's no way that that can feel the same to a person as 10 operations at 95. And my point that I'm getting at here is that each aircraft community uh, interaction or relationship in terms of noise is likely to be different. Uh, I think it's more, probably more likely with the military than the civil uh, commercial operations because the commercial operations tend to have this, you know, similar set of, a similar fleet if it's uh, you know, the 737, 767, and so forth, which are not that different in sound level. And if they get up to around, you know, 200 departures to 300 a day, they're going to have kind of a similar s noise environment. Uh, but when you have uh, very different operations, as, as you can have, 
I think it could be important to know the details of that, the DNL, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So what are we to do about this? And this kind of applies to civil, is, you know, do nothing, just wait until you have a problem and then hope that you can get through it with a, a NEPA or whatever, with the Part 150, establish outreach, work with the communities. And you guys seem to be really at the point where, you know, you've gotten to the outreach and some, some of the air installations are doing a fantastic job from the reports I've seen. Uh, and work with the, the last one, uh, try to get land use compatibility bylaws, which, you know, may or may not work, but I have a suggestion that I'm going to talk about. The land use ordinance has got to, as you know, it's got to be a cooperative effort, and it's going to be a project. It's going to take a long time. Uh, both the airport and, and the community have to want to work together and want to have, a, have to have some kind of plan that you can look out in the future because one of the things that's, that's uh, you know, kind of been difficult for airports is they will go to the extent of getting a new departure corridor or a different turn to try to accommodate a, a community, get the aircraft flying over less dense population, and then they get things set up, they operate fine for a few years, and then development starts in that area. And so the, all the effort that they've gone to is not for naught, but it's kind of um, minimized in value. So uh, choosing uh, compatibility criteria now this is, I'm speaking now from the community's perspective in, in terms of a noise uh, land use ordinance. Uh, I don't expect any federal agency to change from 65 any time in the near future. It's just gonna be difficult. Uh, but there's nothing that says a community can't choose something different if they've got a ba sound basis for it. Um, and the important thing there is to understand the airport's DNL. What is it made up of? There are some methods, uh, supplemental metrics. You've heard that term probably. I know there's a, I think there's Air Force has done a guidebook. Um, and Australia has a very interesting approach that when they got into major difficulties at Sydney with the second runway uh, and the community was, the, the community went berserk. They uh, put speakers outside the, uh, I think it was the, uh, governor's uh, 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 home and played aircraft sounds. I mean, it was just <laughs> Australian, out of control. <laughs> and so they, they backed up and they looked at, okay, they're right, we're not intentionally hiding information, but the DNL doesn't do it. And they've gone to great extent to show which corridors are used and how much of the time and for each corridor, uh, how, much of the, how many of the events are above 70 as kind of a criteria for speech interference. And they don't regulate by that. They don't control land use, but it's a, an effort that's been pretty successful in explaining what the facts are of the, the noise. And I'd like to suggest an alter an, another method, which I uh, call translating DNL. Now, this hasn't been tried, but I, I keep putting, trying to put myself in the, the, the role of a uh, town, uh, on the town council or the dis planners, the decision makers, who know from nothing on decibels. And how can I decide that 65 is the right thing or any particular number? And so there is enough research around, and this has changed a lot since, uh, remember I mentioned that the uh, 65 was done in the 70s. There's been a lot of stuff going on since then uh, to give us more information that we're uh, even more confident of. It's not perfect, but it's, it, it gets us somewhere. What I've got here on the left-hand side are ranges of DNL. And these, this table was calculated for a fairly busy, like 250 de jet departures a day of a civil airport. So it's a pretty busy place with something like 10 to 15 percent at night. All right, so those are the conditions. But I want to emphasize that every airport could be somewhat different, and in fact could be quite different, especially if it were GA or there were light aircraft. And what I've shown here is there's a, now an ANSI, American National Standards Institute standard for <coughs> estimating the number of people awakened at night by aircraft noise. And that's what I've used here on the second column, the percent of population likely to be awakened at least once by, uh, by that, it, at that um, level of DNL for this airport. Uh, an alternative way of interpreting that column of awakening is what's the probability that an average sleeper will be awakened at least once. 
Second one is annoyed. Now this annoyance uh, scale that I used here is, bas is actually a European one, which I think is likely to become the new dose response curve for the International Standards Organization. The data that was used for the 65 is, is quite old and includes not just aircraft, but trains and uh, roadway noise. And the, the revision is, is coming, and whether it causes a change in federal level is, is, you know, something else. But there's no reason the local jurisdiction can't make a decision based on uh, more uh, current data. Then there's some fairly uh, simple stuff about sp uh, speech interference, um, the number of uh, events that would interfere with conversation indoors, windows open. And then <coughs> one that's a little bit more questionable, but we found it to be uh, roughly true, is that uh, the, the type of events that will cause feelable vibrations, it has to be a certain level that uh, the models can predict. And so you've got across here uh, a set of um, results from different levels of DNL, and you know maybe it's possible that if uh, working with, if a community is interested, the, the decision makers could say, well, 65 seems a little high to us, or maybe it's okay. It's even possible to contour these things. The percent of percent of people awakened can be a contour, and a combination of the contours and these values could lead to a rational decision, as rational as can be about what's appropriate criteria for their land use, if they're, you know, the, assuming they're willing. So here, a case study is uh, Naples. This is a little different in that they didn't use that method, but their 65 DNL contained no sensitive land use. And uh, they had a lot of complaints. Uh, Naples is primarily uh, a light jet airport under 75,000 pounds. You call them corporate jets or GA jets, whatever you want to call them. And uh, you probably know that aircraft are categorized, civil aircraft are categorized by stage. Stage two, the higher the number, the quieter they are, stage two, three, and four. And stage two for the large aircraft has been banned in the U.S. since 2000. But they didn't do anything about corporate jet. They let stage two fly. And there really aren't that many stage two aircraft but Naples decided uh, we don't want them anymore. Uh, there aren't that many. They're the ones that raise all the complaints. They're much louder than the others that normally fly here. So we want to ban them. And they decided this in 97. Now, I don't know if you know about the FAA, but they don't like anybody putting any restrictions whatsoever on any of the airports that they have grant assurances for. And Naples, the uh, airport manager uh, went through trial tribulation and virtual heartbreak, heart, uh, heart attacks, getting through the process, the legal process. But he was able finally to prevail. And the reason he prevailed is that since 97, they have uh, permitted no sensitive land uses within the 60. And when the judge got in, the court got into the details of the uh, 65 as a guideline, one need only read that this is not a criteria or a standard. This is a guideline, and local jurisdictions may use alternative uh, compatibility guidelines. And it, it was pretty irrefutable that, well, they clearly have done that, and they're basing their decision for uh, uh, banning this, uh, the light jets on the fact that it affects the 60, the 60 DNL. So it's, it's acceptable. And finally, they got it, and they, they banned the stage two uh, corporate jets. Uh, so um, just in summary, uh, I, I think as you guys have found, it's really in the one-on-one -on -one relationships, the personal relationships, being forthright as you can about the, the noise, ex noise exposure. I think you're in a bit of a different position from the civil in that you're, you can't hope that the aircraft are going to get quieter. In fact, it seems to go the other direction. Uh, but nevertheless, um, it's a communication and the kind of the breakdown or the expansion of what DNL really is that might be helpful. And we go into this in the report and there's a section on, not on, um, it's not a noise ordinance, but it's uh, the best guidance we could give within the, this project for developing a noise ordinance. And these things that you've seen here are in the report as well.
Okay, thanks. He's a tough act to follow because he's got cool numbers and you know. Um, one of the things that we wrapped up the, the project with was, you know, it's good to have all this background information. So we talk about, you know, what's incompatible, why would we consider it to be incompatible, but it was almost as important to us to provide the readers of the report with tools. You know, okay, we've told you how to do it, now how do you do it? And we, we broke it down into some pieces and parts that um, we felt we could tackle on different levels. You know, we definitely heard, I think if you were in the session earlier, you know, that there's different ways you need to go at it. You need to prioritize what can you as a local community do and, and can you handle. And, and our study was no different in terms of looking at, you know, there's, we broke it into f uh, four different primary areas. You know, Nick has just mentioned one, you know, the noise mitigation. Um, some places we recommended, you know, maybe you do just a standalone noise ordinance if that's really your focus. If, if the Trudeau, uh, two land use issues aren't significant, but it's really about noise, maybe a noise ordinance can do uh, as well as, you know, partnering that within sound insulation or possibly sound barriers. Working them back up, you know, we looked at, you know, land acquisition. I mean, when all else fails, that sometimes is an option for you as far as just fee simple acquisition to remove incompatible uses, um, avigation easements if it's to control height on obstructions or remove obstructions, um, and real estate disclosures. We've seen that used fairly effectively in some places that, you know, as Nick has just mentioned, there's places that are outside of what are considered to be true impact areas, possibly for noise or land use, but are certainly something that we consider to be an area of influence or an area of interest. We've seen real estate disclosures where we're at least putting property owners on notice that they're in those areas, they should be cognizant that that's there and that could be an issue for them. Um, natural features, um, that we've seen, we're seeing more and more of that on the civil side, you know, FAA is required and has created a waterfall rollout for having wildlife hazard uh, assessments and plans at civilian facilities. Um, you know, we're seeing a lot more of that, you know, a lot more coordination of, you know, we, we need to coordinate wetlands, we need to coordinate landfills, doing a lot more where we're looking at not just is it near the airport, but what else is out there. Um, Detroit Metro Airport is a project that I worked on. We had a racetrack that was proposing to come into um, the north side of the airport uh, on the other side of I-94 and build a racetrack that had a, a two-acre pond in the middle of the racetrack. Um, it seemed fairly benign on the surface, but when we started looking at light emissions from the lights, um, we had potential issues with the horses being upset by the noise of the aircraft. And then we tied in and we talked to the USDA folks, their wildlife uh, services group, and um, lo and behold, we've got water detention ponds on the airport, and we have a landfill about three miles away. And the USDA said, you're gonna create the perfect stopover so that we're gonna have gulls going from the airport properties right through the approach pattern into the uh, racetrack pond moving onto the landfill. And uh, it turns out the racetrack was built, but not in that location. They went farther south of the airport, more away from those other uh, ancillary uses, but you know, if we had looked solely at that location and not looked at the ancillary pieces, um, I think we would have had a real problem on our hands that we'd have had a lot of uh, uh, birds being ingested into engines. And so, um, you know, looking at those natural features and what's really out there, um, a lot of airports have started going into a general inventory. Uh, we had an airport who said, I'm gonna go out and inventory everything that I think could be uh, an issue within a 10 mile radius. And this was just an airport manager who said, for my own information, I'd like to know what's out there. And he was quite shocked to find that he had a landfill. <laughs> he had a wetland um, conservation area that he didn't even realize was there that was looking to expand. Um, and so he immediately got on the phone and started making those connections to inform those folks that, hey, do you realize the airport's here? I didn't realize you were here and working through some of those. And again, none of these are things that, you know, may or may not have come out of an actual planning process, but are things that could be done as it relates to land use. And then finally, saving the best for last, you know, is planning and zoning. Um, you know, as, as planners, um, you know, developing comprehensive plans, both at your airport as well as the local community, that's obviously where we start drawing some of those boundaries um, of where are areas of influence that we've got to be cognizant of. Um, some of it you can get away from that zoning word by maybe having some pretty restrictive comprehensive planning in place that's going to help guide where your development is um, through your master plans, compatibility plans. Um, Obviously going into zoning is probably the, the best bet in terms of it then gives you the legal authority to do it. 
Um, Naval Air Station Pensacola was one of our case studies and was really one of our shining lights of our study in terms of um, they, they had gone through, a, a, just recently gone through a, a JLS study and um, really helped portray for us how you have to make it a cooperative effort, how the implementation has to be a cooperative effort, and um, really brought home the fact that you have to have something that you can galvanize the study around. Uh, apparently being the home to the Blue Angels <laughs> and all the naval aviators that are there uh, was huge. I mean, when we talked with them, there wasn't a person that we talked to both at the uh, elected official level, at the base level, and we went out and we talked to some um, local citizens just out of curiosity. You know, we asked uh, for a few people that we could talk to to say, you know, how do you guys feel about this? This was done. What was your reaction? And because they understand the value of having that facility there that they couldn't affect or didn't want to affect detrimentally the, the mission of the, the facility, um, they were on board. They said, as much as I, I don't like being told what I can do with my property, I know it's for a greater good. Um, one of the things that was interesting, you know, is the government is joint over it. Um, we talked uh, quite at length with uh, Scambia County, and um, I forget the woman's name that we talked with, but she basically said, I don't make a move. If it's in one of these zones, I immediately pick up the base, uh, the phone to the base and the base planner and we talk. We figure out what's the potential for this. <coughs> and one of the things that I found really interesting was that, um, which I didn't know, so it was new information for me, is that um, because of the training that they have there, they said it wasn't so much about true land uses in terms of maybe residential use or the type of use, but they were very concerned about the light emissions because a lot of the um, nighttime uh, operations that take place to uh, practice for the um, instrument approaches with night vision take place here. And they were starting to reach a threshold where that mission could be jeopardized because there was getting to be too much ambient night light that was affecting that. And so they said that was something that was very important to them and that helped convince the community that they were able to discuss that, that that could really impact uh, the future of the facility that helped them um, get this approved and, and use it. So like I say, they were a very um, helpful case study for us. One of the other things that came out of the study, and, and they really then showcased our planning effort, was a lot of people said, <coughs> well, we'd like to do zoning, we'd like to have an ordinance, um, but we just can't afford to generate one from scratch. And so a part of the study is looking at, we gave, a, created a template that can be utilized. Um, and the background on that is we, we looked at a lot of the resources that the FAA had developed, um, and it's spread over a number of advisory circulars. We also looked at some state zoning enabling acts that are out there um, at a number of states and kind of blended and took the, the best of the best, if you will, that we felt really helped us um, solidify that and um, created a model state legislation as well because there's a number of states that don't have zoning uh, authorization to do that. Um, some of them have started to consider it. Uh, it's kind of a, a bad time right now in terms of you know, the economy that most of them are saying we don't have staff uh, ability to do that, but they've put it on their radar that they're interested in doing it um, in the future. And really we are looking at, you know, some of them uh, are, we're encouraging them even if it's just from a, um, uh, grassroots perspective, the state of Iowa, for example, uh, firm believer that we need to do com land use compatibility, um, but pretty much a home rule state has said we can't afford to go to the governor's office and ask for some sort of legislation, um, but what they're doing at their state aviation office is offering funding to local communities. Um, they went out and created a guidebook to um, give the guidance that they felt was needed and are now offering up to $50,000 towards the development of a zoning ordinance um, to, <coughs> as part of an incentive program. So, you know, they're looking at different ways can they do that and um, trying to develop what they can. So in the project, um, we developed, like I said, a model zoning legislation. Um, I don't expect anybody to read that, and if you can, I'll pay you a buck. Um, but what it really does is works through, um, it's got a lot of lists, the kind of area that you can see kind of outlined in a dashed that's actually a best practice. And so there's a lot of commentary in the template that talks about why would we suggest this, what kind of things could you tailor, and um, what are pieces that we really feel are just core that you would need to keep to preserve the integrity or, or content of, of the ordinance. And then the same thing with the state legislation provisions. Um, we've really looked at how do we enable you them for local zoning, um, how to address non-conforming uses, and also reviewing procedures and enforcement. So 
all those are also in the zoning ordinance. Um, and a lot of it we've really tried to focus on making sure that it fits fairly parallel to current uh, zoning practices within a community. As you heard earlier, you know, making it so your existing Board of Adjustment or Zoning Board of Appeals or Planning Commission can step into that role fairly easily is certainly a goal. You know, the last thing we want to do is create another group of government that's going to have to review something and add to the process. And so a lot of what uh, is in here in terms of the uh, sample ordinances looks towards that. That's a sample of the model zoning ordinance. <coughs> Why is it going back the wrong way, don't I? No? Where's my extra slide? Um, and this is a sample um, of one of the tables that was in the zo local zoning ordinance that kind of gave you some um, direction on different zones. As a part of this, we had to create a sample to show um, areas. And so zone A is, for example, your runway protection zone area. Zone B is your extended approach. Uh, C is kind of the transitional surfaces parallel to the runway environment. And then D um, in the civilian side would be the horizontal surface, that you know, larger circular radius around the airport. And so you can see what we've done is suggested different types of either restrictions or um, uh, types of development that we may or may want to exclude or at least regulate within those different areas uh, as guidelines. And then to kind of follow that up, uh, we've got one final case study, which is Wilmar, um, uh, uh, Minnesota. Um, they're uh, General Aviation Airport in uh, northwestern Minnesota, and they're the, the poster child for um, if you ignore it, it will come back to haunt you. Um, the airport's been around since the 1930s, two runways. Um, the town father said, you know, it's just not that big a deal to us. It's kind of for, you know, the, the rich folks. That we really don't see the economic value of having the airport. And so development continued to encroach on the airport to the point where FAA finally threatened to remove their funding and said, listen, it's gotten to such a point that it's now unsafe. We don't feel it's... Uh, uh, a safe environment for us to have aircraft coming in and out of the airport, <coughs> and therefore we're going to force you to do something about it. Um, what ended up happening was they put uh, um, a discussion down and said, well, um, it's going to cost almost as much, a relocation cost of $16.2 million, uh, comparable to what the buyout cost would be if we just close the airport. And so they uh, decided that they would relocate the airport, and the city share of that was $2.7 million. They had a lot of the local businesses that came to the table and said, no, we do need to keep an airport here. It's vital to our community. And so they've, re, they've relocated the airport. Um, I believe it's about five miles away from the new site, or the old site, um, and it's about two miles from the city center. And they've gone from ground zero with no zoning, nothing in place at the old airport, and FAA said, before we give you a nickel towards this new site, we want to see all the draft plans that you have of how you're going to protect it with an airport zoning ordinance, what you're going to do, how it's going to be implemented, who's going to govern it. And so all of that was in place before they turned a shovel of dirt at the new site. And so, so far, uh, knock on wood, um, they've, they've, they're moving ahead. We don't have any incompatible uses, and they're doing uh, a pretty good job of, of maintaining it and keeping an eye on it. And that's really the, you know, the story of it. You, know, you can go through a lot of these, but if you don't continue to police it, I don't think you're going to see it work. I think Ian's comments about uh, um, down in Florida in the previous session, you know, that the study was done in 2006 and it took four years before they resurrected it and, and really got it going. That's very similar here. Uh, Wilmar managed to go and use some of their um, uh, zoning board through the city, and so they didn't have to create a new board. And so where you can get that overlap, you know, has been very beneficial. Um, with that, the, the document itself, if you're interested in it um, as, a, as a guide or a tool for you, um, as I mentioned, we do have three different volumes to it. Um, we were told by the ACRP folks that we might have won the award for the most amount of stuff that we gave back to them. And we said, well, it was all good stuff. We didn't know where to stop. Um, so volume one is the fundamentals and the implementation resources, the bulk basically of what Nick and I have talked about today. Volume two um, is a summary of the survey as well as all the case studies. So, you know, if you're interested in any of the case studies, I know there were three of them that we did that were military facilities. Um, they're in there. They range anywhere from about six pages to somewhere over 20. That's the highlights of our investigation with them and conversations. 
Um, and then volume three, um, they didn't actually print, it's just an online version, which again is uh, more information on accident data and third party risk discussion, uh, the economic methodology if you're interested in that in more detail, and then that annotated bibliography. There's also a couple other resources that we just point to that you might be uh, interested in. I mentioned earlier on the ACRP uh, discussion, there is a legal digest that they did prior to our study that focuses on airport zoning restrictions, and uh, it's a pretty nice companion piece to the guidebook. Um, there's also um, ACRP uh, 0205, which is now report 15, the one in the middle, that's a, a noise a toolkit for managing community expectations. Uh, it really puts you in the seat of the folks in the, on the community side of how do you manage noise impacts. Um, and then there's also one from the Mineta uh, Transportation Institute that talks about smart growth principles as it relates to airport zoning. And with that, uh, the web page again is uh, uh, trb.org forward slash ACRP if you're interested in a copy. Thanks. <laughs> Well, I, I want to take this opportunity to, again, uh, thank Stephanie and Nick for being here um, and participating in, in both in the development of this report and in today's panel. Um, I did bring my personal copy, or well, my office copies that I've commandeered of the two volumes of the report, um, and if anyone wants to take a quick look at them after the session, but they are easily downloadable on the website, so I highly recommend taking a look at them. Uh, we have about uh, just under 15 minutes for questions. If anyone would like to ask one, um, please do come up to the microphone to ask your question. So I see one coming in and then. You alluded to the impact of wind farms. I'm assuming you mean radar and navigational aids. So Both. when are you starting the study as it affects GA and commercial airports? Sorry, what was the last part? When are you starting the studies of that as it relates to GA and commercial airports? Uh, we've put a request in that it be a study. Uh, we're not sure if it's going to be selected in the 2012 round or not. Um, I know there's a number of communities that are pushing FAA to say that this is a huge issue that has to be addressed um, without a lot of response back so far. Thank you for your presentation. Um, has anyone evaluated the effectiveness of real estate disclosures? Also another topic that we uh, submitted. Um, <laughs> I took that slide out because I figured we'd run out of time. Um, we had five uh, different topics that we recommended additional study. Effectiveness of real, uh, relocation or, or real estate disclosures um, and navigation easements were both topics that we suggested. Uh, so far, unfortunately, it's fallen on deaf ears. Uh, I just, we worked, I mean, we started working in, uh, gee, it was late 70s with BWI, Maryland State Aviation Administration, to go through the whole process of setting up state level legislation for the, uh, uh, the state to control, to run two airports, and that part of that was uh, health and welfare criteria so that they had a baseline to aim for, and it's the whole process, in fact, it was a the model for Part 150 studies. And within that, we got a disclosure. But the thing is, the disclosure comes at closing. How useful can that be? You have to, I mean, you know, you have to get to the people before they make an emotional commitment. Because otherwise, and if you, most of you, I assume, have bought a house and at closing, you're signing 30 sheets and who knows what's there. <laughs> and some lawyer's telling you, this is for this, this is for this. And oh, yeah, you're in a noise zone. And it's like, well, it's kind of late to do anything about it. And I don't know what the right solution is because you know how realtors are and the sellers, they want the best price they can get. And all sorts of obfuscation is used or, you know, going at the right day, the right time so that there's no aircraft. And I talked to a friend about this who is a hard-nosed, he has nothing to do with noise, but he's extremely hard-nosed and factual. He's a, he's a nerd is what he is, <laughs> computer nerd. And he says, oh, he says, that's easy. Set up a zone around the airport and say any realtor that wants to sell, sell, air, sell real estate has to bond themselves. And their bonding has to say, we will, as soon as someone comes in, we will send them to the airport. And if they don't do that, they lose their bond. I mean, now I don't know 
the political ramifications of doing something like that, but that's the kind of thing you, the airport needs to talk to those people before. And I've started conjuring up web things. You know, people are using the web to find homes. Boy, if we could just put a link to the airport's noise office or the, you know, uh, community plans and liaison, liaison office or something like that to just get them into the, the that, that communication thing before they go out and start looking at their lovely homes that they want to get. Hi. Um, I find it interesting that you guys have just now gone through the process that the military went through 30 years ago, complete with the accident plotting and, oh, yeah. and defining the zones. A um, couple things. I would like for you to clarify when you say noise ordinance, what you really mean, because generally a noise ordinance is to limit noise, and local governments can't limit noise of aircraft. Uh, that's only controlled by REFA. A. And then also, when you were doing your incompatibility on your noise, on your little cheat sheets, I'm assuming you also looked at the FICUN reports in terms of or FICUN, FICON, whichever version it was at the time, um, and, and were ensured it was consistent with that. Yeah, uh, that, that's one for each of us, I guess. Uh, yeah, the noise ordinance, I, you know, what is the right wording? It's land use compatibility, land use zoning, something like that. It's not that they can say you can't make more than so much noise. The issue is what kind of development is, la is, is permitted within this, this particular noise area. But more just targeting purely the noise standpoint and its effects versus, you know, true, uh, more encompassing land use itself. And then, yeah, the um, the noise element, uh, we worked very closely to make sure that that mimicked FICAN. 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 Yeah. As you folks have been uh, tracking trends in aviation, uh, GA airports, commercial services, uh, military airports, and especially because you're associated with the research part of it, is there anything that you might suggest that military uh, community planning and liaison officers begin to think about as uh, growth continues with remotely piloted aircraft, RPAs? Uh, that's a great question. Um, we're actually, uh, we're looking at that on a number <laughs> of, of levels. Um, we just con completed two system plans for the state of Iowa and the state of South Dakota. And that was a huge issue for them, um, pondering that question of what's gonna come from that um, even as it relates to uh, UAVs, you know, on a, on a civilian level. Um, the, the pushback that we've gotten when we've asked those questions of, of the federal agencies have been, we don't know yet, and as soon as we figure it out, we'll let you know. Um, so, you know, a lot of the conversations we've been having, and, you know, we're seeing it with the whole next-gen technology as well, is that there's a lot of additional surfaces, there's more review that's being required and requested. Um, you know, what, what we were told 20 years ago is with that coming online, things are going to get smaller because we're going to be able to get more precise, we're going to be able to get it more fine-tuned. Well, if anything, we've think, seen things expand because, well, we're not sure that it's really that precise yet. So I, I guess, you know, to say anything official that we've seen so far, no, we've seen a lot of, uh, you know, wait and see what happens, but I know a lot of airports are themselves starting to think about what would I do. Um, we had a couple of the airports in Iowa who said, um, we want to attract manufacturers of these kinds of vehicles on the civilian side because we've got large spaces of an open area that we could, you know, test them in or, you know, we've got large air areas at the airport that we could put the f uh, manufacturing facility on airport. And so they're thinking about it from an economic standpoint, but I'm not sure that anybody's really looking long term of what would it do then for the airspace side of it. Doesn't really answer your question, but. <laughs> Let me just add something. I'm not sure it's directly related, but it's something that we've been pondering is the NEPA process is an inhibitor to creativity in airspace because if you do something that's too far removed from what's there already and it's a federal action, then you've got to go into NEPA and that can be expensive and time consuming and I don't, I haven't seen much about this except I think there was one guidance from CEQ that it would be appropriate or all right to look at only 
the effect of concern, for example, noise, rather than going through this litany of everything you can imagine that might be environmental. Um, because we've seen the NEPA process, um, or the, the desire not to do NEPA, uh, inhibit some creative community airport related efforts to make things better from an airspace perspective. Thank you. How have you proposed to deal with non-conforming uses in airport overlay zones? So you have uses that don't comply with new um, provisions, land use compatibility provisions. Typically what we've done so far with uh, the different ordinances that we have written is we've treated them very similar to how a, a you know, typical community would, that uh, you know, they're allowed to continue. Uh, should they burn down, they would have to be rebuilt according to current conformity. Um, you know, because we don't want to get into a takings issue, I mean, in a lot of cases we just, you know, don't have the funds to either combat that legally or, you know, by the use, um, we've, we've taken kind of a, an approach of uh, it can't become any worse, that, you know, it's there, unless it's actually an obstruction to airspace, we've really worked towards saying it's, I don't want to use the term grandfathered, but it's, it's non-conforming, and unless you try to make it any worse, we'll deal with it. And so far, that's been fairly effective. Um, you know, we've reverted to whatever existing local planning would apply towards a non-conforming use and applied that. Yep. Um, I would also add to answer that question. Um, tomorrow, um, during the session um, on, um, on um, community responses to demands of military mission growth, um, you'll hear from Dave Buer from um, the city of Lakewood in Washington where they've used their um, business licensing uh, process to, um, over time, reduce the number of employees within. So they're tomorrow uh, during the 1 o'clock session or 1.30 session. Uh, two questions. How do you prevent dense uses from moving into these areas? Like, do you say you can only have so many people per acre, or do you identify the uses that are problems? And then the second question is, um, when you're requiring sound attenuation, um, what a, would a regulation look like for that? Uh, is it very prescriptive, like say you need this rating of insulation, or do you recommend that the developer have to hire a professional in sound attenuation? What uh, has there, do you have any successful cases for both of those questions? Should I take it in two parts? Yeah, <laughs> two parts. Uh, uh, the first question, um, typically what we've looked at there is the, um, uh, what's the best way to go at that? Um, we've, um, gosh. You go. You want me to go? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Just that quick it was going. Yeah. Uh, one example that I have been involved with uh, is in Baltimore, again with the state running the airport. Um, the way the legislation is set up is they have a noise zone, which is based on the 65, and it's a little bit unusual and it's based on the largest area uh, for the next uh, 10 years, basically, and that's the noise zone. And then no development can occur within that noise zone without a variance from the Board of Zoning Appeals, which was set up just for that purpose as part of the legislation. And what the requirement is generally that they, they put upon a development, and it tends to be infill uh, that they are most amenable to rather than a whole subdivision. Uh, they put requirements that the interior noise level be no more than 45 DNL uh, once it's constructed, and that to get that, uh, they have to hire a acoustical consultant to spec the construction and to say, to commit themselves, the consultant can commit themselves to saying, these, uh, if built in accordance with these specs, it will achieve a 45 DNL inside. And the 45 is based on the the contours that the airport provides. So um, they've got a pretty good way of, of uh, controlling it, and it seems to work pretty well. I've testified before the Board of Zoning appeal, Appeals on, on some cases, <coughs> but
but um, so you've got someone who's not airport related making a judgment who's supposed to be an expert judging that it's adequate and that they're basically saying if they do it this way it'll it'll conform uh, it is possible for them to then go back in fact they can require uh, that they do post construction measurements uh, and since it's within a noise zone and there are aircraft overflights it's pretty easy for them to set up a monitor outside and one inside and get a, up to I think we, we wrote the the um, uh, testing specs I think they have to get something like 30 outdoor simultaneously outdoor and indoor measurements and it's got to achieve enough reduction that it's going to be 45 inside that's Baltimore Washington International Airport uh, you can call um, uh, see I mean I talk with it all uh, <laughs> Uh, 410-859-7925 and her name is I will come up with it I mean it's crazy <laughs> on, on the density issue um, what we've been historically doing is trying to avoid getting into um, actual numbers because they can be so subjective um, California is one of the few states that you know has d historically done that with the density uh, ratios and they're actually revising their state guidance right now and are considering possibly changing that um, they are evaluating right now though what that would do to every ALUC that exists and how that would turn it upside down so it's more of a um, uh, evaluation locally of how much open space can you get more than the concentration of the people uh, in true numbers you know it's you know if it's a 7-eleven and people are moving in and out but there's relatively few compared to a big box where you've got a larger concentration or a mall where you're going to have a more static group to consider than a you know hard and fast it's 50 or it's a 49 cut off that does bring us to five o'clock um, so for those of you who would like to stay um, as long as our panelists sure. are willing to keep answering questions we're happy to but um, thank you I'll make it quick it's just a comment I want to thank you both very much for a great presentation after the last one that was here we were all left with the idea of planning and zoning as the way to fix everything but the other things that you mentioned are great I just want to uh, hit up especially the acquisition and notification procedures we all can't be at the same thing at one time there's a repi program right in the <laughs> exactly. other hall and uh, with our base um, in central New Jersey the, that repi program is fantastic in terms of um, purchasing development rights for those things that people don't think they're going to do but we can get them now beforehand and we're actually looking at the repi program to acquire uh, 88 room motel conference center bar restaurant and Dunkin Donuts that's built right across the street from the end of the clear zone in McGuire Air Force Base That's right. Um, this session, as with the previous session, uh, was videotaped and will be available on our website at www.oea.gov. Um, so please feel free to share with your colleagues. Thank you. term clients. Uh oh, actually, I'm going to go down alphabet.